Nancy Pelosi, when she was sworn in as the uh, Speaker of the House, she referred to the Great Seal on the back of the dollar bill and Novo Sordo Seclorum and, you know, the destiny uh, that the forefathers saw then for a new world order. Yeah, and, and when she was sworn in, one of the first things that they did, the 110th Congress, that's where she was made Speaker of the House, one of the first things they did, like within weeks, was pass House Resolution 33 to honor the Freemasons of America. So it's interesting, she's making reference to the Great Seal, and then they, they want to set forth this declaration to honor the, uh, the Freemasons of America. And what some researchers have tried to argue now, like on the History Channel, uh, you know, there are even some Christian apologists who are trying to, you know, prove the Christian origins of America. And I'm not necessarily against that idea. I do believe that Christians came here early on through the Puritan Pilgrim movement uh, and have always been here from the beginning. Uh, our contention is that they were not alone, that you had these occult groups, and many of these guys were pretending to be Christian when they weren't really. It sounds um, like today. I mean, uh, you know, that's one of my biggest things. I mean, I totally believe in freedom of religion, but when you have people like George W. Bush, who presents himself as a Christian conservative and is not only a member of uh, Skull and Bones, like you said, but has visited the Bohemian Grove, uh, which is featured in these films as well, and their occultic owl symbol, especially in the Eye of the Phoenix, uh, that's, that's early on in the film, but basically that's their little club logo. And he presents himself as a Christian conservative, and so many people who would fancy themselves as conservatives and Republicans and Christians actually believe that that's his religion, and it's anything but. Exactly. In fact, we one of the things we point out is his uh, his interview with uh, Charlie Gibson, where he talks about how there are you know many routes to finding God, and he believes Islam and Christianity are two different routes to getting to heaven. And uh, that's not at all a Christian confession. You know, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Now, whether a person believes that or not, that's the Christian confession. That's what Christianity is. And, uh, and Bush clearly does not believe that. Uh, and what's sad is that, I, I mean, I've got a lot of friends who are evangelicals, very, you know, and a lot of them very patriotic Christians who believe in doing the right thing for our country and so on. Uh, and they really strongly supported Bush, and uh, and then after he became president, was, he was making decisions that they were very disappointed in. And then they found out about his that his skull and bone stuff, that this wasn't just a conspiracy theory, that it's the truth, you know, and that he that he doesn't even really believe the gospel as it's given in the Bible. So uh, a lot of Christians were very disappointed by that, and uh, and sorry that they had given him their support. And now what's happened, because of uh, because we're bogged down in this war in Iraq that uh, most of the country is, is not happy about, uh, a lot of people are, are angry at Christianity and evangelicals because they supported Bush so much. And it seems like a lot of that backlash, because Bush was so heavily discredited, a lot of that backlash then fueled uh, the support for many people for Barack Obama. Yeah, so, and when you uh, look at this whole thing, it, it looks like they want that backlash against religion because, you know, one of the major themes in all three of these films is bringing about a, a new age, uh, an age of co Aquarius, if you will, uh, a new world order. And, you know, before we move on from America's Secret Beginnings, the first one, the new Atlantis, I'd like you to talk a little bit about Benjamin Franklin. You know, this is a guy who is revered throughout American history, but he's also a guy that was into the occult. And for those who don't know, you know, occult just means hidden knowledge. And one of the clubs he was a member of was the Hellfire Club. Oh, yeah, over in England. Franklin is a, uh, a very interesting character from that, that era to study. He was a member of secret societies in the three countries that were involved in the American Revolution, America, England, and France. Uh, he was the master of the lodge at, uh, in Philadelphia. Then he goes to France, and he is initiated into the, uh, the lodge of the Nine Sisters there in Paris, and he becomes lodge master there. He eventually initiates Voltaire, the, you know, the great French writer from that era. Uh, and you had, you had prominent Freemasons uh, and revolutionaries. The, in fact, the whole French Revolution was started out of the, that particular lodge. And uh, Franklin was celebrated as this, you know, uh, famous figure when he was there in France. He was very influential. And then he goes to England, 
and with a good friend of his, a guy named Sir Francis Dashwood, who was a member of the House of Commons, a member of the House of Lords, uh, the close advisor to King George III, who was the king that the American colonists rebelled against in the American Revolution. Uh, and he's a part of this secret group there in England, England called the Hellfire Club. All and right, they folks. Part in these orgies and uh, and you know getting drunk and and uh, mocking Christianity and apparently worshiping Satan, according to the reports. And it gets even worse than that. I mean, foreign press said they found corpses of young children in his backyard. It's the Info Warrior with Jason Burmis. I take the vow. All right, folks, we are back. It's the Info Warrior with Jason Burmis and. Uh, if you just caught the tail end of the last segment, I was discussing Benjamin Franklin, his relationship to secret societies and the Hellfire Club. And when they actually went to uh, Benjamin Franklin's house, I think this was a mainstream article out of the 90s. We're going to pull it up for PrisonPlanet.tv viewers. But they found 10 uh, bodies where they shouldn't have been, these, these bodies that may have been used in you know, part of these rituals. Who knows? But it just shows you that what do we really know? about these men and uh, I think you guys make a great point especially in the third one that it becomes a lot easier in the time of photography and film to kind of follow these uh, guys and put faces and names to to who's in, in accordance with this whereas you know with uh, Franklin and Washington you know we have to rely mostly on paintings and writings of them which can be you know kind of interpreted differently but but to move on to uh, riddles in stone now you know one of the big things is this DC architecture that's occultic, paganistic, and one of the more famous things anybody can check out is the pentagram that's in the middle of DC. Now some will argue that, well, it's not a full pentagram, there is one side missing. But you guys do a, do a great job of explaining why that one side is missing in Riddles in Stone in relationship to the author Faust. Why don't you tell people about that? Well, we... Uh you know that pentagram that's the that's the thing some people try to argue it's not there but most everybody including the masons agree that it's there they just question whether or not it's intentional and again like you said because it appears to be an incomplete pentagram and uh, there's several explanations uh, one of them uh, the one that i think seems to be the most uh detailed comes from manly p hall who the masons call you know their greatest philosopher according to their own writings uh, but Hall, in his book, uh, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, uh, gives a list of the, the variant uses for the pentagram. And one of the, the uses is an open or a broken pentagram, where one side of the pentagram uh, does not completely close. And if you look at the map, and we show it in a variety of angles in uh, Riddles and Stone, uh, Rhode Island Avenue is the, is the street design. You'll see the, the whole pentagram there with the White House at the base, and then the pentagram inverted goes upward. Uh, but Ro Rhode Island Avenue does not extend all the way. It only goes halfway. And the reason for that may be several reasons. A, because it's a well-known symbol in Freemasonry and in the occult. In fact, during that same era, the Washington, D.C. street design was drawn out by Pierre L'Enfant and possibly with the help of Thomas Jefferson, although people debate that, uh, between 1791 and 1792. In 1790, you had um, uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the famous German uh, writer, uh, who was a Freemason, and he was also a member of the Bavarian Illuminati. And all of that's fully documented his membership and so on. He was there with a bunch of other intellectuals. Uh, well, he writes in uh, the first part of his play, Faust, he writes about Faust, you know, summoning up Mephistopheles, the devil, from hell, and uh, coming into the room, they have this whole exchange and whatnot, and then Mephistopheles gets ready to try and leave, and, uh, and he, says, uh, he says, let me go up, I cannot go away. You know, there's something on your windowsill, the pentagram, I see. All right? And, or he calls it the witch's foot. And then Faust says, what, the pentagram? You know, uh, if that stays you, if that's keeping you here, how came you in today? How would you get in the room? And then Mephistopheles says, well, observe it closely. It is not well made. Uh, uh, one end on the other side of it 
is a little open, as you see. And so the symbolism there is that the devil was able to enter into the room through the pentagram because the pentagram was open. Now, this actually fits in with what the ancient Pythagoreans believed about a five-pointed inverted pentagram, which they called the pent-alpha when it was upright, and they called it the five-angle, okay, when it was inverted. The pent-alpha, if you go online and you type in pent-alpha lodges, okay, you'll find, uh, you'll find dozens of Masonic lodges that are called pent-alpha lodges, and they go on and talk about Pythagoras. All right, folks, we'll be back for the long segment. We'll be discussing Riddles and Stone and, of course, Eye of the Phoenix, the brand-new 